Hey kids, this is Mr. Fly here, hope you're well, and welcome to the National Motor Museum here in beautiful Bewley. Right, now you may well be asking what am I doing at the National Motor Museum, something that in my mind is all about cars, but it turns out it has motorcycles too. Now I don't really know what I'm up to, but uh, somebody who do, does know is Chief Honcho here, Patrick Collins. Hi Patrick, thank you for having me Morning, at the museum. Morning everyone, hi. So what are we going to be doing today then? Well, we're going to take and show you the motorcycle gallery. Because yep. like you say, everyone thinks we're all about cars. Well, we've got 240 vehicles here, but about 90 of those are two-wheeled. So we'll have a look at the motorcycle gallery, and then we're going to get some toys out for you to play with. Absolutely brilliant. And I've no idea which toys they are, so hopefully let's you've got go something... Brilliant, OK, let's go and have a look. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you've made the weather good for us today, haven't you? It's fab, isn't it? So let's go immediately indoors. <laughs> so... Look at this. Set in the scene. Yep. There is one missing, actually. Genevieve is visiting this year. 70 years of Genevieve. We've taken it out for this weekend because there's a talk in right. our lecture theatre tomorrow night. Yep. So Genevieve's would be sitting there next to the spiker from the same film. But this gives you an overview of sort of the history of motoring from the 1890s. Yep. As you can see, two wheels feature early on, right round through to the modern day. Yeah, well, we've got a current car on display as well. Superb. And a few interesting bikes tucked away. And am I right in thinking the bike collection is all English bikes or British bikes? No, nope, it's international. Is it? It's international. Fantastic. So you'll see we've got, uh, we've got an awful lot of interesting uh, foreign bikes, you know, German, Italian, French, Brilliant. you know, American. In, okay. fact, in fact, you're going to see an American bike very soon. Could that be a hint? <laughs> I think it might be. Right, let's go. crack on. And we'll just we haven't got dates. very far. We'll interesting it. Triumph who comes straight to. Okay. Patrick, tell so us about this. Triumph Thunderbird, that was one of three... Uh, three 650s that rode at Montlhery circuit in France on a record-breaking attempt in 1949. And you say attempt, did it actually succeed? Well, it did, yeah, they built up, a, a, I think, a 24-hour record or something. I can't remember all the ins and outs. Right, but, caught you uh, out yeah. immediately. You did. Excellent. I like 500, to catch people. Like, 500 miles at, at over 90 miles an hour. That's incredible, isn't it? I mean, yeah. performance hasn't changed much, has it, in all those years? Fantastic looking beast. And do, do all these bikes run here? A lot of them do. Yeah, yeah that one. Yeah, most bikes, most of the machine, well, most of the cars and bikes here can run yeah, yep. with minimal amount of work. They're, right. all, they're all kept turning over, so it wouldn't take much to get most of them running. Cool. I love this number plate on here. Imagine uh, hitting a, an innocent old lady with that, yeah. which is why they got rid of them, isn't well, it? Well, that, that was one of a series of three. So the three bikes that broke the record were all JAC, and all the numbers were in, were in order. Got you, got yeah. you. Right, this could be a very long video if we keep <laughs> stopping at every Come exhibit. On. Failed again. We've walked all of about 20 yards and another fascinating exhibit before we get to the bikes. Sorry, Patrick, you were saying. Okay. So this car here. So this car is a, a 1903 de Dion Bouton. Um, and it's been on the Bewley estate since 1913 when it was taken as part payment of a, of a debt from a tenant. Yep. But it's the, muse it's the car that started the Motor Museum when, when the late Lord Montague opened Palace House to the public in 1952. Yep. He put this car on display uh, in, in the entrance of the house yep. as a tribute to his father, John Montague, who was a, a pioneering motorist and a, a member of parliament who, who got a lot of legislation through parliament in the early days of motoring and was really the motorist champion. So what became the Montague Motor Museum and then later the National Motor Museum yep. really started with this car. And I can't help but noticing on the bit of information there, it says six horsepower. Yeah. That's a good, in those days, of course, they were proper horsepower. Well, they're they? proper horsepower. And also, <clears throat> in Britain, uh, that horsepower relates to the RAC rating, which was a way of calculating road tax. So which, is all, really? which is all based on uh, engine, bore and stroke. Fascinating. So it's, an, it's a nominal six horsepower by that, but uh, the, the, actual, the actual power output was probably a little bit greater than that. Yeah. Can I have a quick peer inside? Oh, can. oh excellent. This is, this is the great thing about coming around with the chief man. You get to go off limits. Look at this. Incredible. And this runs, and it regularly takes part in the London to Brighton run every November. What an amazing bit of it's kit. It's not doing this year's, but it was running last year. Yeah. And I, I wonder how much a car like this would be worth. Um, veteran cars like this are a lot of money. Yeah. A lot of money. We'll you, leave it. You, More you, than you and I can afford. You're talking at six figures now, and I don't own one. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, we will get to bikes, I promise you. We will get there. I was just saying to Patrick how these look like horses' carriages. Look at this thing. Yeah, so that's a, a Daimler, that's a German built, or a Kamstadt Daimler from yep. Germany in the 18, uh, 1890s, which is literally, you know, put a couple of horses on the front. And you're away. So where's the engines at the back, I presume? Engines at the back on this one. Wow. But next to it, this one, AA16, is yep. another Daimler, but this is a British built Daimler. So da the Daimler name was used under licence, built right. cars in Coventry. Yeah. And this again is, a, is a, another significant car in the Bewley story because this is the 1899 12 horsepower Daimler yep. that John Montague, the MP, 
he bought in 1899, yep. and there's a number of firsts associated with it, but yep. um, he was the first British driver, along with Charles Rolls, to drive in a continental road race. Yep. He did the Paris Ostend race in 1899, came third in the touring class. Wow. Um, and he also took part in the 1,000 mile trial of 1900, which was really the first chance that a lot of people living in Northern England, Manchester, that sort of thing, and Yorkshire uh, got to see uh, motor cars. These, these newfangled machines were driven, driven on a big tour in the summer of 1900, uh, right up the west coast, up to Scotland, and then down through the northeast and down through the East Midlands. And as I say, for a lot of people, it's probably the first chance they got to see a motor car. Wow, and quite a thing, isn't it? I mean, it's a beautiful looking thing, isn't it? It is. And John Montague, of course, he was the MP, wasn't he? He was an MP. And he was the, he's credited being the first person to drive a motor car into Parliament. He is. Isn't that, he? That's one, another one of the first, and he did it in this car. Was it? I wonder if it yeah, was this did very it in car. This car. Yeah, this, yeah. Is, this is a very significant motor car. And really, Daimler were the, probably just about the first British manufacturer when, when it, everything became legal after the, uh, the Red Flag Act had been repealed in 1896, Daimler were really the first British manufacturer uh, to, you know, to start building cars in any, in any number. Wow. So it's very, very significant. Wow. Excellent. Right, motorbikes. Right, let's do bikes. <laughs> it's no good, I can't resist yet again. I, I'm, I'm a bit of a Lotus fan, check, as a Norfolk lad. Check this out. So there we go. So that is Lotus 49, that's chassis R3 yep. from 1967. So 1967, Ford had paid Cosworth Engineering to develop the Cosworth, the Cosworth Ford DFV engine, the V8 at the back. And can I nip across and look at you the can, engine? You oh, can, thank yeah, you can, yeah, go and have a look. Keep going. Which is a stressed, stressed part of the vehicle, so that everything's bolted onto it. It's bolted to the, to the chassis. Okay, so Ducati weren't first with the Panigale no, then? No. I'm well, always told that, actually. Chassis's bolted to the, uh, the engine's bolted to the chassis, the suspension's bolted to the, to the engine and the gearbox. Wow. And they won first time out at the Dutch Grand Prix at Zandvoort. And then uh, Graham Hill was driving R1 and he damaged it in practice for the 67 British Grand Prix at Silverstone. So Colin Chapman and the team returned to, to Norfolk overnight, got the tub for this one down off the, off the rack, built it overnight. They were still bolting things on it as they, as they were getting it ready for the race on the Sunday morning. That was when racing was racing, yeah. wasn't it? Not well, that it isn't now, to be fair. Look but at this. Uh, this, is, this is the year before wings. Yeah. Um, you know, it's very basic. No ABS it's, and traction it's, it's, it's control a on that. It's a raw, it's, it's raw motor racing. That's proper race, is it? Yeah. If you compare that with, we were just uh, talking off camera actually with a, on a modern F1. Let's go and have a look at that again. I can't, can't resist because the, uh, the size difference is quite something. You won't be able to tell on the GoPro camera, obviously, but uh, tell us what this one is. Patrick. So this is uh, Williams um, FW40 from 2017. This was Felipe Massa's car. Yep. So we're, we're very grateful that Williams, uh, Williams lend us a car and they've, they've recently um, uh, given us this one uh, on loan, and um, it, it just brings the story almost up to almost up to the, the current, the present day, in that we've got a hybrid car. It hasn't got the halo um, safety system in it as the oh, yes, cars I have, that. but otherwise it's pretty much like uh, like modern F1 cars. And even comparing it with cars of a decade and, and 20 years ago next to it, it is significantly bigger. Can I have a look in the cockpit of that? Of course you can. Yeah. Oh, this, mind you, don't trip. This is great. Wow. Not the, I mean, the steering wheel looks complicated, but it's still a pretty basic looking uh, tub in there, isn't it? Well, I think, it, I think it's built for the, uh, for the PlayStation generation. Yes, yeah, which sadly isn't me. <laughs> right, let's go to right, bikes. bikes. Right, so we made it to bikes, Patrick. Bikes. Here we go. Tell us about this collection then. So, we've got about, at any one time, about 90 bikes on display. Yep. We own some of them. Some of them are on loan to us from manufacturers, dealers, right. private owners. So, um, yeah, all sorts. So there's a, a few British classics, as you'd expect from the 70s. Love a Norton me. Silver Jubilee Triumph Bonneville. Nice, nice BSA there. Look at that. That looks like now, it's been well used. Now, at the well moment, used. on loan, we've got three quite significant round-the-world bikes. Yep. Some of you might recognise Steph Jevons' CRF 250. Oh, cool, Honda yeah. Honda. Yeah, nice. So Steph, Steph's yeah. had that on loan to us for a few years. Oh, I like the seats she had. Next to it <laughs> is... Uh, the, the R100 GS that Pat and Ness Garrod rode around the world in, uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. Wow. And little BSA Bantam here, you think, what's this doing here? So the, a wonderful, wonderful lady, yep. Mary Smith, Mary Sevier as she was at the time. Yep. In 1967, she, stuck, she um, decided she was going to ride to India. Wow. And uh, she rode this little Bantam overland to India. One size she, engine in this? It's a 175. Wow. When she got to India, she thought, OK, I'm enjoying this. So she shipped it to Kenya and then rode down through East Africa, uh, right down to Cape Town. Did a bit of secretarial work in Cape Town while she was waiting for passage to Australia. Did you do? Shipped it to Oz, yeah. rode around Australia, rode the length of New Zealand, 
shipped it to Southeast Asia, rode through Thailand and Laos and Cambodia, and then uh, went to live in Hong Kong for a bit. And then in 1976, someone said to her, do you not think you ought to finish the trip? So she rode across the States. That's what you call adventure so riding, isn't it? She's a remarkable lady, and her, her achievement went largely unrecognised until about two years ago when the guys at the Overland event yep. uh, got her to, to present at the Overland event, which she did again last year. Um, sadly, I mean, really, really sadly, Mary passed away last week. Oh, no. Um, and it's her funeral next week. Oh, dear. Um, so we're, we're, there's a, a group of motorcyclists who are going to meet and ride to the funeral in tribute oh, to a remarkable lady and Incredible. a remarkable adventure on a, on a really small motorbike. It just shows you don't need a BMW GS, do you? You don't. You don't. You can do it on anything. Any, yeah. any motorcycle is a, an adventure bike if you yeah. use it. Yeah. It's fantastic. All right. What else we got okay. here then? See some more on. modern so, stuff up there. Well, the modern stuff. This, this motorcycle gallery is actually dedicated to the memory of Graham Walker. Right. Graham Walker was the father of Murray Walker. Oh, right. Now, Graham was a significant motorcycle racer in the 20s and early 30s. He rode in the TT. Yep. Um, he was a worked rider for Sunbeam, Norton, and then later Rudge Whitworth. Yep. This is the Rudge that he won the 1929 Ulster Grand Prix on. It's quite a lengthy bike, isn't it? It's a, they are. Long bike, yeah. Um, so, chain drive. Um, not the best brakes in the world. I imagine the handling was quite interesting just due to the length. The well, you're going, you're going to find out shortly just what this sort of <laughs> bike's like to ride. Not this <laughs> one, but, but similar bikes. Uh oh. But Graham Walker, when he um, retired from motor racing, or from motorcycle racing, yep. he um, became the editor of um, the mo a motorcycling magazine. And then when he retired from that in the 50s, he came to live at Bewley. He retired to Bewley. Oh, and cool. with the late Lord Montague, he built up the original motorcycle collection in what was then the, Mo the Montague Motor Museum. So there's a lot of motorcycles here today yeah. uh, which, which came here because of the, the Graham Walker connection. Wow. And of course he did BBC radio commentaries yep. um, for motorcycle racing and that's how Murray Walker got into, got it. into commentary. And Murray, right. Murray Walker was, a, was, uh, was a, a great friend of this museum as well. I can't resist this Hayabusa at the back. What's the story here then? That's um, a, a fairly well. It, it came to us just before the pandemic, and a, a very den a very generous gentleman decided that um, he didn't want to ride the Hayabusa anymore. Um, <laughs> so this is a Gen One Hayabusa. So it is, you know, the fastest production motorcycle ever made. Cool. Um, and we have an example of it here, and it, it is it's pretty mint. And they're still breaking records today, aren't they? they? Are indeed, With uh, yeah. Guy Martin and people they are like indeed, that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a fabulous machine. Righto, moving on. Oh, okay, so, I recognise okay, that one. So, I'm going to have to be honest, when you work here, people ask you, what's your favourite car, what's your favourite bike? Yep. My favourite bike in the collection is yeah. this. It's, it's Mike Halewood's 1961 TT winning RC162 250cc. Wow. So he won, he, it was his first TT win, uh, first of 14. So he won the 250 race in the morning and then the 125 in the afternoon. And, oh, then, right. and then later in the week, he won the 500 senior TT as well. And that's a four-cylinder, isn't it? That's a four-cylinder, four-cylinder yeah. 250. If I think I'm right in saying my mate and yours, Alan Milliard, didn't he make a replica of this? Alan Milliard built a replica of the 374, ah. which is a six-cylinder. Right, oh. six-cylinder machine. He would have done. Yeah, that and figures. Of course, yeah, <laughs> made from two Yamaha engines, as you do. Yeah. <laughs> but cool. this, uh, this, I mean, the six sounds amazing, as does this. We, we, we've had this run in, uh, in the last year for uh, an event, and it sounds amazing. Doesn't look too bad either, does it? There's one or two mods on it. If you look underneath that um, that pan underneath, there's some ventilation slots cut in that. The the chap that was Mike's mechanic in the 1961 season, a guy called Joe Weaver, when they got the bike, because contrary to popular belief, Mike wasn't actually a worked rider. He rode for his father's team. He was right. a privateer. Right. And they had a they were they did a deal with Honda mm -hmm. to get the 250. Um, and when they first took it out, they found it was overheating. Yeah. So. Joe, the mechanic, cut some ventilation slots in it, which if you look at pictures of, because I'm sad like that, <laughs> of, of, of the other bikes that season, you can always tell Mike's bike because it's, it's got, got the ventilation slots. slots on it. Made all, made all the difference, it obviously. Did. And um, the other side. put it this way, it was enough for it, to whatever the difference was it made, Mike won the world championship that year. The size of the front wheel on that, the narrowness is just unbelievable. Well, even it? compared with Mick Grant's yeah. Kawasaki yeah. from 75. Huge difference. The section is, yeah. is a lot smaller. I like the uh, some sort of cooling arrangement on the front uh, brake cylinder there, or whatever that is. They're sort of yeah. not even disc brakes yeah. in those days. No, well, of course, I mean, the thing about cooling brakes, drum brakes, they yeah. take a lot. So they, uh, manufacturers came out of all sorts of you know, vents and yeah. ribs and all sorts of things to, you know, to try and increase the, the surface area to improve the cooling. Cool.
Righto, moving on. Well, you like a Ducati, don't you? I do, I love a Ducati. So we've got uh, 999, which was Troy, uh, Troy Bayliss's bike from 2006. A bit underrated in their day, weren't they? But getting more collectible yeah, now, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And I do like a 999. There's a 998 road bike there. Oh, cool, look at that. So we've got a nice collection of, I'd say super bikes. They're not all super bikes, but... Um, Oh, I can see but, a fizzy uh, the, around there. there. There's a fizzy around there. It's fire blade. So first generation fire blade. Beautiful. R6. Love an R6. Actually, I rode one quite similar to that. For many people, the original super bike. Oh, yeah, look at that. CB750. The bike that killed the British motorcycle uh, killed The British motorcycle, motorcycle industry. industry. Yeah, look at that. Disc, disc brakes, yeah. <laughs> Gotta love those exhaust headers. Look at that. Yeah, so was that one of the first with disc brakes then? Um, it was um, only the one the disc. First, I yeah, only the one disc, but yeah. it just it just it was, it was everything the British didn't do, and I, and I don't think they leaked oil either. <laughs> to this day, now, my triumph leaks oil. For many oil. years, people people of a certain generation, yeah, me Andy, included, people of a certain generation would come here and say, "Do you know the one bike you're missing?" Yeah. And I knew what they were going to say. It was like, yeah. "We need a fizzy." Yeah. So we do have this 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 fizzy, it's and not, it's in the best colours as well. It's lovely, isn't it? It's some sort of anniversary, is it? The 75th uh, anniversary or something? It's uh, 50 years. It, oh, it must 50 be 50. Years, 50 yeah, years. I'm not that old. 50 <laughs> I remember and riding then, these again, around the fields. If you were around in the in the 80s, you're going to oh, recognise the RD250. The RD, so yeah. certainly for me and my mates, the bikes we coveted were the RD250 LC and the yeah. and the 350 yeah, LC. Yeah, yeah, that is a but, classic, classic. And this is a bike which changed changed the game for learners because in the RD250 LC, here's a 250cc learner legal bike that will quite happily do 100 miles an hour. Crazy, and isn't it? And you can send your 17-year-old out on that with, with very little experience. So that was one of the bikes that really made the, 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 the rules change as regard learner bikes. And that looks as good as new, that one, doesn't it? What a beauty. Well, that is. That one's got about 13 miles on the clock. Oh, my word. <laughs> and then next to it, was, oh, I suppose, another this. super bike, if you like, the, the, yeah. the, the original Honda 6 from, from the late 70s. CBX, six-cylinder. So presumably my, uh, my Goldwing ended up or that engine morphed itself into what became the Goldwing six cylinder. Well, they were kind of, I mean, Honda were very much the, the multi cylinder experts, yeah, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful looking bikes. And then I've got a soft spot. It's not here because of me, but I, have, I do have a soft <laughs> spot for motor goodsies. I do like motor goodsies. I one, won't tell you what my wife calls them. One day I'm going to have one. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, a Jixa. And that's Lovely. quite a heavily modified Jixa as well, but. Uh, I don't know much about these, other than everybody raves about them. Is this what's known as the Slabby? Right, Suzuki fans, forgive me, I think it is, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not I mean, it does look, I'm not it looks somewhat slab-sided there. Yeah, so, I think uh, this is a Slabby, yeah. I'm sure yeah. someone in the comments yeah. will put us right if it's let, not. Let us know. It looks yeah. good. I'm far from an expert on them. Yeah. Right, cool. let's get to the stuff I'm going to ride okay. then. Okay, right. We'll have a quick look at the old. Oh, okay. oh, so, so we did a deal with Ace Cafe, so we got some sort of an Ace Cafe scene since yeah. 50s, 60s. Uh, you like a BMW, so there's I a do, I R50 do. with a sidecar. Um, a few scooters. I love scooters. a scooter as well, yeah, we I love a scooter. Me rode my first Vespa a couple of weeks ago, actually. So, service bikes, not all military, but we've got a selection of bikes here from the First World War, from the Kleino, which was a machine gun unit in the First World War, wow. through various Second World War military machines, uh, auxiliary fire service, a Harley Davidson. I'd say that looks distinctly Harley esque. So that was the, the Model 42, which was used by the, the Americans and the, and the Canadians in particular. Loads were shipped across for the, for the, for the British, but mm -hmm. the, the British Army had spent de two decades teaching its riders, its dispatch riders, to ride bikes with a hand clutch and a foot right. gear change. Right. And suddenly 100,000 American bikes turn up yeah, and, with, and uh, with the other way around. Yeah. So, so most of the British ones ended up being given to the RAF for some reason. Crikey. And there's the old Enfield. That's a prototype Enfield. That's got a fully. If you look at the other side, it's got a fully encased, uh, encased chain drive. It was a so prototype. Get here. Basically aimed at low maintenance for military use. Oh yeah, I can see. There's a there's a case there around the chain. Cool. And then All right. we're, we're coming nearly up to date with a with a Pan European, which was in uh, ambulance service until quite recently. Cool. Right. Right. Onwards. And I, this will give you a flavour for what, some of the things you're going to see downstairs. Oh, so it's going to make a noise in a minute. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> now you'll see there's some gaps. Yep. So you can work. Oh, out. okay then. That's okay. So the, this, this, the gaps are significant. I, I better not flip around that. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's your surprise. <laughs> but um, 
oldest bike in the collection. Yep. There's an early Triumph here. Very early Triumph. This is this is. Uh, where's the Triumph? Uh, yeah, that one. Wow! Yeah. Look at that. Two, two, uh, two and a half horsepower from 1903. That's a very early Triumph. It's effectively a bicycle, isn't it? They are with an very engine strapped on. They're bicycles with an engine stuck in. And a JAP engine as well, or JAP engine. And if you have a look over here, if you really want to see a bicycle, and this is really where motorcycling started in Britain. So here's a bicycle. Holy that is a Perks and Birch, which was later sold the rights to Singer, to the Singer Motor Company. Um, but you basically put that motor wheel in the back of a bicycle and it becomes a motorcycle. How on earth that's do you from an engine to go into the wheel well, like that, that. That's 1899, and look at it. Just look at how it's, it's made. Amazing, they squeezing that in at the turn of the 20th century. They were they were building an engine that you could pack inside a wheel like that. It's, it's quite significant. That is quite something, isn't it? It's amazing. It goes full circle with all these electric bikes now with yeah. their hub motors. Yeah. Oh, let's face it, that's more impressive. And then, and then just behind you, there's a rather interesting, like so, an Ace big four-cylinder oh, American wow. bike. Look at those handlebars. You can imagine an American policeman riding that, can't you? <laughs> And so, the Zenith here, so the, the Zenith, this is a, an interesting bike. Um, it, it's belt drive. Oh, I love this. And this is fitted with a thing called a Gradua gear. Which, uh, a chap called um, F.W. Barnes designed it for, for the, for the, for the um, Zenith company. Mm -hmm. And by turning the wheel up here, yep. you move the pulleys in and out there, yep. and you also ex can extend the length of the wheelbase. OK, and so change the ratio. You get a constantly variable transmission. Right, right. And it in theory, Basically, Zenith won every hill climb and event they took part in because you had this continually variable transmission. Yeah, it obviously worked. And the Auto Cycle Union said, hmm, not going to have that, we're going to ban you. Right. So they were banned from competing in hill climbs and speed events. That, that didn't stop Zenith. They said, brilliant, okay, you're all scared of us. So they put Bard across, <laughs> across their trademark. Yeah, yeah. So they, they made the most of the, of, of the publicity. What a great sales tactic. Yeah, marketing gold, that, isn't it? You're banned because you're too good. <laughs> We're on our way to the workshop, but I had to stop here to look at this Bruff Superior. So this is a this is a Bruff Superior. It's an it's a, an 1150, the 1150 model from from the mid 30s. So it's not the the cooking SS hundred, the, the really truly desirable one, but it's still a lovely bike, and it's it beautiful. was one that was particularly suited to to sidecar use. So next to it, you've got the Alpine Grand Sport sidecar, which was Bruff Superior's own designer sidecar, and the tubing yeah. on the frame yeah. is an auxiliary fuel tank. Cool. So wow, there's, um, yeah, there's, there's, um, I think one and a half gallons of extra fuel in the in tank. Just in that pot, yeah, in that, which can be pumped across to the to the tank when you run out. This pipe here yeah. we're talking about, and goes right down the side of the sidecar. Wow! Yeah. Look at this gauge on here. Yeah. This is amazing. Expensive bit of machinery. Beautiful machine. Yeah, love a bruff me, as did Lawrence of Arabia. Indeed. But yeah. uh, well, we right. won't go into the we too much detail that. there. Right. Anyway, <coughs> into the work. Righto. Oh, this is the exciting bit, look. Okay. Oh, we'll hide the code. Don't look at the code. <laughs> Come on round into what is actually a very small workshop. Do, do, do. Do. Well, nice and quiet in here. Morning. Come on in. So, uh, is Ian? Morning. A bit of a, a BSA rebuild going on here. Nice. 1936 uh, Gold Star, I think. Lovely. Smells good, doesn't it? And over here... Smells of engineering. Over here... There's a little collection of bikes. Cool. Which are out for you to have a look at. Oh, my word. So what we got here, then? Let's so we've so got a 1924 Sunbeam. Wowee. That looks complicated. <laughs> we've got a 1914 Royal Enfield. Because we know you like a Royal Enfield. I do. I love an Enfield, yeah. And a 1915 Harley-Davidson. Goodness me. This is quite frightening, actually. 